Let you go. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Don and the Woodbury County Conservation Board for hosting this Zoom meeting so that we can make a presentation. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, all the viewers for uh, tuning in, uh, all 16 of us. And uh, we will uh, get started here uh, when I share my screen. Jerry, is there anything you would like to say? Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone also. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, stuck here in, uh, in Tucson. And uh, I did see some red tail hawks today. So that, that's a, a bonus. Hopefully I could identify them as something. Uh, just a short bio for Jerry and I, we uh, both started uh, at Sue B. Honey in the laboratory there. Uh, I started in 73, Jerry a few years earlier, and we've known each other since then. And we started birding together about that same time. So we've birded together uh, for uh, a long time. A, cent a century. Yeah, yeah, a century added together. Uh, so uh, since just about everybody on that's viewing now knows us, uh, I'll dispense with any further introductions and get on to uh, red tail hawk. Okay, sorry for that. I not had to sign in uh, times when I practiced this, but uh, tonight's uh, presentation will be on the family of hawks known as budios. And these are uh, diurnal birds of prey and they are our largest hawks. And we're very familiar with one of these species uh, that is uh, a year round resident here. And that would be the red-tailed hawk. Budios uh, in general uh, are robust bodied large hawks with broad wings and a broad short tail. They hunt primarily by soaring or from a, a perch on the edge of the woods or a utility line or something where they can pounce down on their prey which is typically mammals or lizards more often than birds. Our uh, common, our most common hawk in the summer is the red-tailed hawk. In fact, it's about the only budio that we will have during the summer. So we are familiar with seeing a, a soaring bird uh, looking quite like this. And it is identifiable by the red tail, first of all, but also by these uh, patagial marks uh, that are on the leading edge of the wing. Uh, Excuse they me, Bill, commonly... I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt. We're not seeing your screen. You're not seeing my screen. No, okay. we're not. Thank, thank you for doing for interrupting there. And let's go back to this and. Now, now there you we go. have success. Thank you. All right, all right. Uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, what I've been talking about is the shape of these budios with broad wings, uh, short, broad tail, and our red-tailed hawk. Uh, uh, field marks that we're used to looking for are the red tail, the breast band here of variable amount of streaking. But a very good field mark is also this patagial 
uh, line here on the leading edge of the wing. Uh, our our uh, local subspecies called Borealis also has a white chin, and that will come in later and when we talk about winter hawks. But typically, this is uh, the uh, a typical budio and the most uh, common uh, uh, bird we'll see in the summer. Uh, we'll get to some other uh, views of the same red tail. My computer's a little slow here at making this transit. Here we go. Boy, this is going slow here. It's not working like it did in practice here. Right Bill, now. we can see the dorsal view of the red tail right now. You do? Okay. Yeah. And uh, although this is, a, I, I do want to thank the people at the Macaulay Library at uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology for these slides tonight. Uh, these are slides that uh, either you or I or anyone else can submit along with our eBird reports and they go into the Macaulay Library. Uh, I went out there and borrowed some images tonight and uh, uh, some of the slides are not very illustrative of field marks. So uh, I've picked out the ones that I thought were best. But from this dorsal view of a red tail hawk, uh, the main field mark you can see is the red tail. And these uh, typically have a little tiny bit of white tips on the end of the tail feathers, but uh, this red tail will appear red on the dorsal view. And from the underside, it is usually more white. Uh, sometimes you'll see the sunlight coming through it where it will look a bit red, but a dorsal view is best for seeing the reddish tail. And the other thing you notice on this is you got some uh, white uh, speckling and things on the back uh, where a lot of uh, the other hawks are, are more uniform on their back. So that, that's a clue. Oh, it's not letting me click. There we go. Uh, can everyone see the perch bird then? Yes. All right. This is a view of the underside of the tail that we just talked about where uh, sometimes you can tell it's pinkish uh, if the light's coming through the tail, but a breast band such as this one shows is also a, a good field mark for the red-tailed hawk when on the perch. Uh, this particular bird here is our low, uh, still we're talking about the subspecies Borealis that is around here year round and it'll have a white chin here. Yeah, you, you notice it has a, a relatively dark head. Here's another Borealis where the uh, streaking is very limited, uh, but it does have a little bit of streaking there. It still has a white chin, uh, contrast with the dark head like Jerry mentioned. And again, uh, this is an adult bird, so it'll uh, have a reddish tail. I'm going to... Uh, 
go back a bit to the soaring hawk and next talk about uh, about the back of the bird. Uh, again, uh, this is similar to that dorsal view in flight. We can see the red tail. Here's the white speckling on the back that Jerry mentioned. Uh, this particular bird, we can see the white throat again too. It's unusual to see red tail hawk perch on utility lines like shown here. They have rather large feet adapted to catching larger prey like squirrels and rabbits. And that these larger feet make it a little harder to perch on utility lines, but this is a very heavy cable, so he's able to perch there. So now we're familiar with uh, our local resident, year-round resident, red-tailed adult bird. And our main field marks are that patagial uh, line on the wings and the red tail. But of course it isn't, that simple because we also have immature birds here. And the okay. immature birds uh, will not have a red tail. Uh, they will have a fine barring on a brownish tail, uh, kind of a, a darker uh, bars than what the tail is brown. And uh, this bird will still have these patagial from the underside will still have the patagial marks that uh, we saw in the adult bird, but we will have to identify this guy based on those patagial marks and the barred tail. And some, something about this bird is uh, you can see those windows on the on the on the wings, which uh, uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But if it has uh, that type of window, that that's uh, pretty diagnostic of a of a, a red tail. Uh, immature uh, red tails especially have these lighter colored uh, right. inner primaries that Jerry's referring to as a window. Here's a perch immature bird, and you can see the barring on the tail more plainly here. From this view, we also note the white uh, scapulars on the back. Uh, 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 red tail hawks typically have a, a, a fair amount, especially of this uh, subspecies, have a uh, white spackling in the back. And it looks like, uh, uh he or she was uh, working on a bird. Yeah, this one caught a bird. You can see these feathers uh, littering the ground. Now, if it was summer here all the time uh, and there wasn't such a thing as migration or winter residence, this would be the only bootio that we'd really need to know, uh, the red-tailed hawk with the adult with the red tail and the immature with the barred tail and both with those patagial marks. But as we know, we do have migration. So we'll move on to some of the other hawks and I'm gonna close some of these red tail images here. And one of our winter residents, uh, our, our second most common budio uh, in our area is present only in the winter and it is the rough lake hawk. And uh, this is distinguished from uh, our red tail hawk by a, a couple things. And one is it seems to have longer, narrower wings than a red tail does. The red tail that uh, uh, I could almost has long secondaries here that makes this trailing edge bulge out here a little bit on the wing. So it appears to have broad wings. 
the rough leg, uh, narrower wings, uh, uh, more dark coloration on the belly, not so much on the breast as a red tail does, but a dark belly with an additional dark flecking underside. But these on the, at the wrist mark on the wings are diagnostic as well, as is a whitish tail with dark bar or terminal band here on the end. So three things here, the shape, or four things, the shape of the bird, this dark belly, the dark wrist marks, and the white tail with a pretty distinct band uh, across the end. And sometimes you can see they have a they have a small head with a smaller bill than a red tail, so it, I, it looks smaller. The, 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 it makes the bird look larger actually with the small head. Here's the same uh, view from the dorsal side, and uh, we cannot see those wrist marks so much, but. We do see how distinct this tail is with a white base and a dark band across the rear. Different age groups will maybe have a, a secondary thin band up here, but they're all a white tail with a dark band like this. Here is the perch bird. And these are some of the things that Jerry was mentioning too. Uh, Seem to have a small head and bill and kind of pale coloration. Uh, they have a, a, a sometimes a streaked breast like this, but a dark belly. And again, we see the tail pattern of a white, white tail with a dark terminal band. Now we talked about the red tail having big feet uh, rough leg has small feet and it specializes in catching small mammals such as mice and voles. Uh, so it has small feet and look at the size of this wire it's able to, to perch on here. It's just a, a, a rather narrow diameter cable and it's able to perch there very comfortably. And we see that uh, uh, rough legs are perched at the very tops of trees on tiny twigs whereas red tails are usually further down in the tree on a, a larger uh, limb. So we have, uh, in the winter, we have red tails, and we have rough leg hawks. Uh, during migration, we have a couple other species of budios that are, are fairly common if you know where to look. Okay, here is a, a smaller budio that we get spring and fall in the broad-winged hawk. And uh, the best features of this, uh, it's more a woodland bird, usually seen and associated with uh, uh, above the canopy or perched below the canopy of a, of a forest. And the uh, best field mark on this bird is a broad white band between two black bands on the tail. It has a robust body and broad wings, but it will be smaller, uh, noticeably smaller than a red-tailed hawk. Another field mark on this adult bird here is his dark trailing edge. Remember the red tail had a patagial dark area here. The broad wing has something completely different and that's a, a dark trailing edge on the wing. So uh, here on this adult broad wing, we're looking for this uh, heavy breast coloration, kind of reddish even, uh, the trailing edge, but most importantly, the white, broad white bar between two broad black bars on the tail. And unlike the red tail hawk, where we 
you really can't tell it's red from underneath very much. You can see the broad-winged hawk has the same pattern uh, visible from either below or above. Uh, here's the broad black bars with a broad white bar in between. Uh, on a good view, you can see a, uh, another white bar up above that. But typically this broad white bar is the most conspicuous. Here's a view of a, an adult bird. Uh, again, showing the tail pattern we're looking for, broad, black, white, and black barring on the tail. Uh, coloration, uh, kind of a rich chocolate or reddish uh, brown uh, barring on the breast. <laughs> Immatures will look similar to this. They'll have uh, smaller bars on the tail. Uh, and they'll have streaking on the breast. And those are usually more easily identified by just their small size because their coloration uh, and patterns aren't as conspicuous as on this adult. Uh, this perch bird, even you can see that dark trailing edge of the wing in this photo as well. Uh, another, uh, I'm going to close a couple of these. Well, uh, a minute, I guess. Another migrating hawk that we have, particularly in the spring, is the Swainson's hawk. And this is a more western bird. I guess the broad wing is more typically east of here. The Swainson uh, wanders into our area from the west. And uh, it is a unique hawk uh, because it is one of the few species and the only species we see here that has darker flight feathers than what the wing linings are. On uh, the rough leg hawk and on the, some of the darker red tail hawks, we're going to see a dark wing lining with light flight feathers. But Swainson is different than that. It always has darker flight feathers and what the wing linings are. Also, it has a conspicuous brown bib here, contrasting with a white chin and a barred tail. A little bit longer tail and wings than what uh, red tails appear to have. Yeah, they're very distinctive when they're uh, up in the air in that, if you can see them like that. Uh, Birch is a little distribute. different. But their wings are kind of up tip uh, in a dihedral as turkey vultures are, whereas a, a rough leg and red tails have rather flat wings when they're gliding. There is a perched bird. And uh, in this view, we can see the uh, dorsal or the backside coloration, which is a rather slate gray. And we mentioned the white spangling of that is on the back of a red tail. Uh, that contrasts quite a bit with uh, Swainson hawk, which is very uniformly slate gray on the back. Uh, on the ventral side, again, we <laughs> see the uh, bib with the white chin, uh, a brown bib with a white chin and a barred tail. These are birds that will be seen uh, following a plow in the spring. They will be on the ground uh, where the soil has been turned, looking for insects uh, as they hop around on the ground, looking for insects or anything else that the uh, uh, mice even that the plow will uh, uncover. So in, in summary, we, we have our red-tailed hawk year-round. We have the rough-legged hawk that is here in the winter time, and uh, two migrant 
Budios are the broad-winged hawk and the Swainson's hawk. Now, if you can all see this map, can we see the map? Yes. Yes. This explains why winter is an interesting time for hawks uh, in our area. And there are uh, uh, 12 to 16 subspecies of red-tailed hawks. And where we live here, we have the Borealis uh, year round. And that's the bird we just talked about. Uh, uh, it, they're all pretty uniform, uh, except the young have a, a different type tail. But to the north of us are three other subspecies that in this red area is where they spend the summer, but winter they have to go further south. That, that's partly due to temperature perhaps, but also the length of the day. Uh, if you think about it, a diurnal bird of prey like a hawk, in the short days of uh, winter uh, would have a harder time catching prey. So uh, we have Harlan's red tail hawks from Alaska. We got Polaris hawk from uh, much of the Western Canada and Western US. And we have Crider's hawks in this area. And all of these birds come farther south into this purple area to spend the winter. Uh, since these come from the West, uh, all three of them, uh, here in Western Iowa, we have a better chance of seeing these subspecies than farther East, even in Eastern Iowa. Uh, they don't see them as often as we do. So now we're gonna talk about those three subspecies that we're going to see uh, visiting in the winter. There's our broadwing park again. <laughs> Come back. And one of our red tails that's here in the winter is the Harlan's red tail hawk. And this is the one that breeds uh, in Alaska. And although a few of them may be light colored, like our 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 borealis that lives here. Uh, a vast, vast majority of Harlan's hawks are dark like this bird shows. So what we expect to see in a Harlan's hawk uh, in the air like this is dark wing lightings, a dark body, and a whitish tail with a dusky tip to the tail feathers. This formerly was considered a separate species from red-tailed hawks when I started birding and Jerry and I birded together uh, uh, in the early days, a Harlan's hawk was a separate species. And it is quite a bit different from the other subspecies of red tails. And uh, perhaps someday they will again, give it a separate species designation. But the, the best uh, two field marks for, uh, uh, for this hawk are the dark body and wing linings and the whitish tail with uh, uh, dusky tips on them. And I'll have a, another view of this bird as well. From the dorsal side, you can see, uh, uh, although it does have a dark tips along the uh, tips of the feathers that we can see from underneath, from the dorsal side, we can see there's kind of streaks going up the length of these uh, tail feathers as well. But it's mostly whitish up here and mostly uh, a dusky indistinct band across the, uh, the tip of the tail. This being a darker hawk, we see less white spangling on the back th than we see in our, our resident Borealis subspecies. And they used to be quite rare in our area around Sioux City and everything. But in the last, what, 10 years, uh, you see them just about every winter uh, at some point. I agree. So I agree. 
they've really changed. Okay, from the front, uh, from the front uh, of a perch bird, we'll see a very dark plumage. The head's dark, uh, breast and belly are very dark. Uh, sometimes they are lighter with some streaking across the upper breast. And they typically have a little whitish spot between the, the eye and the bill. But again, the tail pattern that we're used to seeing from underside, mostly a, a, a dirty white color with uh, indistinct darker terminus. And these, these birds are uh, uh, quite easy to spot. Uh, uh, they differ so much from our uh, uh, typical red tail hawks. The only thing you can really confuse it with is a, a, a dark uh, rough leg in the winter. Here's maybe a little bit more typical uh, Harlan's hawk that we see in the, well, I won't say that. I won't say it's more typical, but you will see them like this as well, where they're dark, just like the previous bird, same tail pattern, but they'll have uh, more streaking up here uh, on the upper breast. This one still is light colored between the eye and the bill, but it doesn't have a specific white spot like we saw on that other bird. Here's a way they're often seen perched on a utility pole. And from the front, we'll see that dark coloration, but in back, uh, we'll see the white tail with uh, dusky tips across the uh, tip, well, across the tip of the tail. Since, uh, as we mentioned with uh, Borealis, it takes about two years for uh, a budio to get its adult plumage. So we will see uh, young Borealis here uh, each summer and through the winter, but we're also gonna see uh, uh, immatures of these Harlan and other subspecies of the red-tailed hawks as well. And here, uh, just like in the Borealis, we have a barred tail adult pattern. Uh, again, the immature is dark, uh, much like the adult. It has dark body and dark wing linings. But rather than that adult pattern tail, we have barring. And this is separated from uh, the tail of uh, our typical red tails in that the uh, it usually has a little bit heavier bar on the very tip of the wing compared to these others farther up. Those are usually narrow. Here's an immature uh, Harlan's hawk. Uh, Again, it has a, a dark underside that's hard to see from this view, but it has the barred tail, a little bit broader on the tip here. And it, it has a little white spot between the eye and the bill too. Uh, so this would uh, be a little harder identification, but this would be a Harlan's immature.
here's a, another view pretty much showing the same thing. Uh, uh, relatively dark and back here, but it still has a fair amount of white spots on it. But this barred tail again with a broader band at the tip. And if we could see the front of this bird, it would be dark in front as well. So we've uh, talked about our Borealis that is here year round. Now the Harlan's red tail, which is here just in the winter. And it's a just about always very dark bird. But we likewise get very light colored red tails in the winter. This one here is uh, called a Crider's red tailed hawk. And this one's uh, going to look a lot different in that its head is white. Uh, it hardly has any breast uh, streaking here. And the tail, which you can't see well in this picture, but it's white from underneath as well. So what we have is a very pale bird in front, this being an adult, quite a bit of more white in the wings and the back than what a typical, our typical red tail shows. This is a good view of an adult uh, in flight. And again, we can see the white head, the real pale coloration, kind of a white background color to all the uh, upper wings and the back. And in this being an adult bird, it does have a reddish tail, but the red is limited to the very tip of the tail, the outer one third of the tail or so, where the rest of the tail is whitish here. And we are going to see intergrades of maybe Crider's hawk with our Borealis. And maybe all the Criders we see won't be this white. Uh, they won't, but they'll have a, a, some of these uh, uh, field marks of the white head, whitish on the back, white tail with a pale uh, pinkish uh, or orangish tip to it. And we're gonna see immature uh, Crider's hawks as well. And they're gonna be much like that adult rather than having, but rather than having an orange tip to the bill, they're gonna have fine barring. But generally the, the tail does look quite whitish. We can see the white head from here. We can see the quite a bit of white uh, across the wings and back. Uh, the windows that Jerry mentioned on our Borealis uh, imagers, uh, that's here too, and even whiter or more conspicuous perhaps. Here's the underside of a Crider's hawk. Uh, our most diagnostic field mark for red tails is a spazial pine here. And you can see how pale it is on a Crider's hawk, along with paler wings, paler body, paler tail, paler head. Uh, the markings uh, when present are pale as well. This one, it's hard to see the barring on the tail, but there's a little bit of barring there. so. This would be an immature Crider's red tail. Here, here's another immature uh, Crider's red tail. And you can see this tail a little better, a lot better than in the last photo. The whitish head a lot of white pale coloration on the back and the tail that's largely white 
with uh, uh, some fine dark bars across the, the uh, dorsal side of it. The light coloration is usually the first clue uh, of a Kreider's hawk. It will appear much lighter than the other subspecies. If anyone has any questions on this, I, I'd like to pause a minute and anyone that would like to unmute and ask a question, we'll, we'll try to address that now that we've covered two of our winter visitors. Jerry? Jerry? Yes. Do you ever see Kreiders or Harlands in Arizona? Uh, no. No, it, you, you might see some, some Kreider influence uh, and you, you, the, the ones that are nesting right now are, are very, uh, light colored, but I, I would not call them criders. Uh, but, uh, they're, they're, they're light colored and, and they're nesting. Uh, you have a lot of influence with, uh, uh, other budios here that, uh, get, it's a uh, kind of complex. Uh, obviously, um, uh, a zone tail or a black hawk are uh, are uh, common. Uh, well, they're not common, but uh, if you go to the right places, you you can find them. And uh, it's 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 very interesting uh, the way the red tails here are. Uh, lighter you when bill gets into the uh caloris uh ones uh we'll we'll talk more about that okay thanks there's actually uh uh jerry when he's in arizona near tucson there's another subspecies down there called uh where to sigh <laughs> where does uh red tail and it's kind of similar to our uh, Eastern uh, Borealis that we're used to. It's more similar to that than right. any of the other subspecies we're talking about. Okay, we'll move on to the last of the subspecies that we're going to cover that uh, are typical here in the, or not typical, but often seen here in the winter. And this is the Calurus subspecies. This breeds in Western Canada and in the Rocky Mountains, but they uh, do show up here in the winter. And they're going to be similar to the Harlan's hawk that we just looked at, except they're going to have, the adult will have a red tail rather than that white tail with the dark terminal band. Uh, they'll have a dark wing linings, dark body, and uh, a reddish tail. Now the tail will be a darker red if you get a good view of it, but, and they'll be a, generally a darker bird than uh, uh, anything. It'll be darker even than some of the Harlots. Here's a dorsal view of the, the uh, Calaris in flight. And you'll see a rather dark red tail here. It has dark tips across, across uh, the tail feathers here. And you see there's less white and a dark head. It is after all a darker subspecies generally. Right, in, in the winter in, in Tucson, you'll see a, quite, a, quite a number of those and everything. And like right now, they're very difficult to find. Uh, they're, they're the ones that, and they're nesting, they're very actively nesting right now. And uh, the, they're, they're the light colored, uh, uh, they're not the Borealis, they're probably the Fuentes, uh, that, that type of, uh, uh, of uh, red tail, and they're of course nesting, so they're very territorial. Anything that uh, is any type of threat to them, 
they'll really go after them. A good view of uh, many of the Calaris subspecies will show just how dark red this tail is. Uh, you have a really dark band here, uh, subterminal. It's a little white beyond that, but uh, uh, on the tips here, you have this broad dark band, and but even dark barring on the tail feathers of the Calaris. It is going to be a darker hawk. A darker body, it's going to have a darker red tail, and often that's due to uh, these dark bars being intermixed with the red coloration. Even up here, uh, there's reddish on the upper tail coverts. Now, here's uh, Here's a, a Polaris uh, perch. You can see the tail tip here. It, it's reddish down there and has a dark, dark tip to it. So we know this is an adult bird. And he's all chocolate brown or brown black in front. And we'll see quite a few of these birds uh, in the winter <laughs> here. Uh, and we'll have to separate mo the adult birds from the harlands just by the tail pattern primarily because they're both very dark. And uh, this guy will have the, uh, the Calaris will have the reddish tail and the Harlands will have that white tail with the dark tips. Bill, this is Dawn. Do you think that our red-tailed hawk, our captive one, that Scarlet, do you think that she's a Calaris perhaps or? Captive you have a captive one there? Yes, we do. I don't know if I've seen that. Okay, uh, you'll have to stop out and see the raptor house. She's really dark, but she's not as dark yeah. as our last slide, but she is a dark when, uh, uh, when was it? When was it collected, do you know? I'd have to ask Kay Newman if she has those records, you know, she's she believes she's a quite an older bird, but I don't know if it was in the wintertime or not. I, it was a gunshot wound, so. Uh, well, that would probably indicate winter as well. If it's yeah. A gunshot wound too, during the hunting season, but yeah, uh, it, it could be one of the darker subspecies, the Harlands or the uh, or the uh, Calaris. Does it have a red tail or? Yeah, very red. Okay, then it would probably be the Calaris. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now I'm going to leave you with one more rather conflicting thing to all, all my rules here. <laughs> and the uh, Calaris, we've talked about it being a dark bird with a dark front, a dark red tail. Uh, it also comes in a light form, which is quite similar to our uh, Borealis, that is our year round resident here. But there's a few things that will help us. Uh, pick out uh, a light form of the Calaris. And that would be, uh, it has real heavy patagio lines here. That's more than our Borealis ever has. Uh, it'll have a dark chin. Back when we were looking at the Borealis, I pointed out a white chin on our, our resident birds. Uh, this bird, uh, although its entire body is not dark, it does have that dark chin. Its tail is also rather dark with a dark, rather thick, dark band at the tip. So, and, there, and there's a little more coloration, more of a, a tawny coloration on the body and on the wing linings here. That's another indicator that this isn't one of our, our Borealis, which is white here primarily. Uh, so we got a dark gen, heavy patagials, kind of a tawny, body and wing linings and a dark red tail here. Now, uh, there are immatures of uh, these uh, Polaris too, but uh, we're not gonna go into them today. <laughs> uh, I might get too confused if I start doing that. And uh, so we'll just leave it here uh, with the uh, three winter visitor, uh, uh, different forms of red tail hawk that visit in the winter, a Harlan hawk, a dark one, primarily the Calaris hawk, another dark one, and the Kreider 
that uh, uh, is very light colored then. And uh, I'd like to open it for questions for anyone that's still awake. Well, one of the, one of the things I want to I want to say is uh, the uh, 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 John Dunn has broken it down in into these basically five species or subspecies, and uh, the they do a really good job of uh, doing the descriptions and everything, uh, so you can differentiate between them. Uh, they, it's it's the best field guide for red tail hawks the, of, the, of the common field guides. So which book is that, Jerry, that you're citing? You said John Dunn's the author. Of, uh, well, actually, actually, or... I had, had a, he, he hints at it uh, pretty heavily in the second edition, and he's up to the, is it sixth edition is uh, the highest one, or is there a seventh? Oh, okay, you're talking about National Geographic then. Right. Okay, yeah, there is a seventh edition now. Yeah, right. And, I got uh, the I got the seventh one, and he's got it broken down very very nicely in that. And the sixth edition has it broken down very nicely. Uh, and before that, it was kind of hinted at. And Sibley goes through a whole rigmarole, but really doesn't have the detail to differentiate. So. The, the map that I showed, that came out of the sixth edition uh, of the uh, National Geographic. That was very enlightening to me when I first looked at it. And I could see why all these northern hawks are going to come down here in the wintertime. So we're going to see these other subspecies. And uh, they can come from as far away as Alaska or as near as uh, North Dakota, but look a lot different than the subspecies we're used to seeing year round. Bill, this is John Nylon. Uh, I had two questions. The red tail that's the mainstream red tail that's here year round, does it maintain the same nest or does it build a new nest every year? And then the second question is what is the average lifespan for the red tail? Uh, they probably do, they do reuse nests. And I would guess, I, I probably read this just last night, but I, I would guess their, length, uh, their longevity is something like 15 years or so. Yeah, I think I, I read 15 to 20 years is uh, in the wild. The females are larger than the males uh, uh, as well. That's something I hadn't mentioned. Yeah, they're 25% heavier uh, than the males, roughly, but uh, you really don't notice. Uh, I haven't been able to really uh, determine uh, male and female unless you get them uh, both together and you, you, you sometimes can, can see a size difference. Uh, and, uh, but uh, they're supposedly 25% heavier. And whether that uh, makes them larger or not is hard to tell. The photos that I uh, gleaned through, uh, the, there's very few that call them either male or female, but the ones that do, I think, uh, are taking the pictures of the birds just leaving the nest. So they can see the size comparison when they're on their nest and also their different duties at the nest site is an indicator which is the male and which is the female. Bill and Jerry, this is Lisa. Um, do both male and female help with raising the young? Yes. Hey, uh, it takes uh, uh, both of them hunting to, uh, as the uh, fledglings get or nestlings get larger to uh, bring in food for them. Um, Bill or Jerry? Yes. This is Sharon. Um, is it too late to see these winter visitors now? It's getting there. It's getting there. Uh, it, it may be that it is, but I, I've seen dark, 
I've seen them in April before, but they're they're they may be birds that have gone even further south and are coming through here to the north uh, they, now. But uh, most of the ones that spent the winter here are probably gone. Yeah, they should be nesting, and of course uh, they don't normally nest here, so they're moving to their nesting areas, and uh, the ones that do nest here are uh, defending their territory. So they're driving out the, uh, probably the immatures that uh, aren't really interested in nesting yet. Thanks. Bill? Bill? Yes. Didn't you have a craters down at Oego a couple of days ago? Yeah, uh, that uh, was last Saturday. There was uh, a Criders immature at a week ago. Hey, Bill, how, how, how soon will the other Budios show up as far as like the Swainsons and the Broadwing? Uh, Broadwings, I've seen them in mid April before. It seems like we see most of them in the uh, first week of May or so, but I've seen them even north of here uh in mid-april so they're probably coming through any time now swainson's i think a little bit later but uh they'll be coming through uh, uh second half of april as well and into may i think there was a uh a, a swainson sighting in iowa uh this past week but and broad wings are probably here or there. Got to remember our Iowa reports, they're going to get them about a, and most of the Nebraska reports are going to give us a good clue what's on the way. They're starting since most of the state is south of us. So uh, if they're showing up at the more southerly locations, we can expect them sometime in the next week or so. Bill, this is Paul. Yeah. Wilson. Uh, I, I just sent you a message. Uh, I would like to, uh, if it's possible, to have a copy of the uh, Excel file that you uh, were uh, clicking off there, if you could, would mind sending that to me or to anybody that wants it. I'm wondering, would you be able to do that? Ten bucks. Ten bucks. <laughs> Done. Deal. A lot of work in it. Uh, I could send that out, uh, but I would caution those are uh, some of those are copy, or maybe all of them, copyrighted photos of someone else. So the you could use them for your own use, but uh, they wouldn't be publishable. Or uh, there's a lot better photos out there on uh, eBird uh, Field Guide or Birds of the World the Field Guides portion. But those photos are all protected and copyrighted, and you can't really reproduce those. But these are. Uh, available for use for instructional, the Macaulay Library. So I, I could send that out to those that want it. And uh, you can kind of go through them uh, uh, and uh, study them for yourself as well. And, and the other thing, um, uh, uh, I, I had two Swainson's hawks uh, late last week uh, as I was going across Arizona. So they are on the way. All right. Where are you spending the night, Paul? Paul's on his way home from Arizona now. So yeah, we are. We're actually in Waukee, uh, and tonight we are. Uh, the reason I was in late uh, is we're at my daughter's house. Okay. In Des Moines. So Paul will be back amongst us shortly. Yeah, about a week from today. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to stop sharing and we'll be looking at each other again. Uh, any <laughs> other questions or? Bill, do you want to say something about the outing coming up? Uh, there'll be an outing Saturday. Uh, meet at Walmart on Singing Hills in the northwest corner of their parking lot. And uh, we'll pretty much stick to our own vehicles uh, due to COVID reasons, but we will car. A caravan uh, to the Oxbow Lakes in the south, 
uh, we're going to be looking for uh, these hawks, uh, for one thing, but we're going to go to oxbows that are all low with water level right now. So uh, we hope to see some shorebirds and some other water birds. Any other questions? Who's our master of ceremonies here? I'm not, but Bill and Jerry, thank you. <laughs> You're you are welcome. Now. I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, tuning in, and I hope this uh, will uh, help you next winter, especially uh, when we get these uh, different visitors here. And uh, also, we'll uh, alert you to some of the migrants that uh, are due here any day now. The rest of us are going to be looking forward to you and Jerry doing a monthly presentation on some other species. So um, get ready to do that, Bill. Well, I hope it won't be as complex as red tail hawks are. <laughs> <laughs> there's like, you go south, there's uh, uh, about 10 more or 12 more subspecies. Like South Florida has its own, Cuba and Hispaniola have their own, Jamaica has its own. There's little islands off Baja, California that have their own species of red tail hawks. And of course, the mainland in Mexico has uh, two or three species or subspecies as well. So uh, it's a very complex, uh, uh, complex, really. Yeah. Well, that's why John Dunn does such a good job for where we live on explaining the differences for what we see. So. And, and and we won't be able to identify each and every hawk. If they integrate, if you get a Calaris uh, uh, mixing with a Criders hawk, uh, as they may do in North Dakota or something, it, the offspring may not fit uh, any of the rules that we uh, tried to lay out tonight. <laughs> I say field trip to the Baja. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I like that idea. Jerry's two thirds away. <laughs> Salt and Sea is calling. Jerry's good to still see you down again, Jerry. there. So good to see you again, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> well, All right. thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I'm glad this was a much more successful event from past month. Yeah, <laughs> we missed out on some of the excitement of last month. We will, uh, Graham McGaffin and Dottie Zales was saying he was interested in maybe doing that again um, in a, a different uh, environment. So we'll see if we get that going at some point. But next month will be a nice program. Dottie's still on? No, she's not. Check the newsletter. I can't remember all the details. <laughs> anyway. Thanks, Dan. This has been recorded, so if we can get it figured out, I'll get it to Randy. It'll get on, on the Audubon website. Good job, Bill and Jerry. Thank you. Well, I hope it was worthwhile. Have a good night. It was. Thanks again, Don. Take care, Bill everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Be well.